Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are a great and awesome God. We love you. We admit we don't know what's going on all the time. We can't figure it out. But as has been stated already this morning by those watching, you know the plan. You wrote the plan. And the plan is being followed perfectly. Thank you, Father, for your being in control. That you're, you're so awesome in that you know everything. You can do everything. You control everything. And we don't have to worry about what's going on around us. We don't have to worry about this virus. We don't have to worry about all the things and the turmoil that are going on because you are in control. doesn't mean everything will be just fine from our vantage point for us, but ultimately it will be perfect because we're yours. Give us a great time as we study your word. Let us understand you a little bit more because we've studied your word and let us have a better relationship with you. Let us relate to you better. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're working through the Gospel of Matthew, and we come to the end of chapter 26. The Gospel of Matthew is all about the king and his kingdom. And in the end of chapter 26 and the beginning of chapter 7, we see what I have titled, Denial and Demise. Our text is late on Thursday night, early Friday morning of the Passion Week. Jesus has been arrested and beaten in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew skips over Jesus being taken before Annas, the former high priest. Jesus was then taken to the house of Caiaphas, the current high priest. And we discovered last week that the trial in the house of the high priest was trial for many reasons, and Caiaphas ultimately hears Jesus confess to being God and the Messiah. This gives the Sanhedrin cover for their conviction of Jesus into sentencing him to death. We saw last week that all the disciples had fled from Jesus. They said, that's it, we're done, we're out. We're not going to pay any more attention to what's going on because we're so disappointed. They were frustrated that the guy that they had spent three and a half years following didn't even put up a fight. They left their homes and businesses to follow him and he wouldn't even put up a fight when being falsely accused. And so they gave up in frustration. I suspect that they couldn't articulate what was really going on in their mind. They, they wanted to know, but they didn't want to follow anymore. We saw last week that P Peter had followed Jesus, ending up in the courtyard of the house of Caiaphas, sitting with the servants and the, and the guards. And that's where we pick up our story this morning. The first section is Peter denies Jesus. We begin in Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. We saw last week that the temple police and the mob arrested Jesus, and the words that are used, they put hands on him, they laid hands on him, not to bless him, but to beat him up. And they eventually took him to the house of the high priest. Peter trailed behind, you know, watching the mob, keeping an eye on what's going on, and, and he, he wanted to know what was happening. And so he made his way into the courtyard of the house. And he sat with the servants, and he sat with the guard, <coughs> and in a position where he could hear what was going on in the house. We should remember that Jesus had warned Peter. Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Before sunrise, when the rooster is cock-a-doodle-doo, 
you're going to deny me. No, 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 Peter said. Remember? I'll die with you. And for a little while, Peter was even willing to, to fight against innumerable odds until Peter told him to put his knife away. Peter thought he was pretty tough and he was ready to follow Jesus wherever he would be, even death if necessary. But the scene in the courtyard of the house of Caiaphas, Peter is with the guards and the other servants near the burn barrel. But one of the servants recognizes Peter as being from Galilee. The servant adding the Galilean was probably using an insult against Jesus. Galilee was the backwoods. The people were often viewed as those in Jerusalem as being illiterate and unsophisticated. I suspect that Peter spoiled from a little from the insult. I also think that he realized that he was all of a sudden in the middle of the enemy territory. Think about how this probably happened. Jesus is following, or Peter, I'm sorry, Peter is following Jesus at a distance as the mob takes Jesus to the house of Caiaphas. He's following, but not really involved anymore. And he worms his way into the inner courtyard where the burn barrel is, where they're sitting by the fire, the servants and, and the guards. I think probably Peter did that without thinking about it. I mean, that's the typical way he does things. Peter just does them and then thinks about the consequences later. And so when this girl came up to him and said, hey, you're a Galilean too, right? He all of a sudden looked around and said, oh, oh I'm in a bad situation here. I kind of believe that Peter vapor locked right then. He recognized perhaps for the first time that evening that he was in the middle of enemy territory. And now he was being challenged. Well, you're one of his followers. You're a Galilean. And so I think he kind of vapor locked and he wasn't really prepared for what came. Yeah, Brian says, oops, said Peter. I love that. Matthew 26, 70. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I don't know what you mean. So here's the scene, right? All of a sudden, he looks around and, whoa, or as Brian would say, oops. Here I am in the middle of it. No, I'm not part of his. I don't think Peter intended to lie. I don't think Peter intended to deny Jesus. It's just what happens sometimes. I don't know if this kind of thing has ever happened to you. But it has to me, and I admit, I confess right before you and God and everyone else, that in a situation like that, I have lied to get out of it. All of a sudden, I was faced with something very uncomfortable. And I suspect most of you, if not all of you, have done the very same thing. If you're truly honest about it, you have done that as well. Sometimes, in the heat of a moment, when you're confronted with the reality that this is not what you expected, a little lie comes out. Peter replied that he didn't know what they meant. Of course he knew what they meant. Of course he knew that they're saying he was a Galilean just like Jesus was. Was They were linking the two. Peter knew that, but he was faking not understanding. He was now in the middle of enemy territory and he didn't know how to extricate himself. Peter was not talking just to the servant girl. He was talking to the entire group. Somehow, he was in the middle of this enemy territory and being confronted. And he was doing whatever he could to get out of it. Only hours before, Peter had been willing to die with Jesus. But right then, in the middle of enemy territory, he blurted out that he didn't know what the servant meant. What we should see here is that Peter's first response is that he evaded the original question. Peter was trying to sidestep what was happening. But the end result is that he denied 
being a follower of Jesus. Verse 71, And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. I don't know what, I don't know the man. Peter begins the process of extricating himself from the middle of enemy territory on the burn barrel. So he says first, I don't know what you're talking about. And then you can imagine that he's just kind of slowly backing up, trying to get away from the attention. And he gets to the gate, to the entrance of the courtyard. And another servant girl says, well, this man was with Jesus. I do not know the man, comes Peter's response. He gets a little more demonstrative. And he invokes an oath to say that he's telling the truth. Of course, he knew he wasn't telling the truth. And they knew he wasn't telling the truth. Isn't that the way it normally is when somebody says that? He was committed to this course of action now, and he was willing to swear to it. We need to consider what Matthew means when he says that Peter denied it with an oath. When an oath was made in Jewish culture, it would typically invoke God and make him party to the assertion. The oath was tantamount to calling on God's judgment if the spoken words are false. Tell a lie, hope I die, kind of thing like we do as kids. He was lying to him in the courtyard and challenging God in doing it. Peter had de descended deep into the depths of this lie by invoking an oath. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crowed, I me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So Peter's denied Jesus twice so far. Here in verse 33, some others standing there come out and say that Peter had to be one of the followers of Jesus because he also had a Galilean accent. <coughs> Peter had no wiggle room left. Dr. Luke tells us about an hour transpired. So he was, he was in the burn barrel, first denial, makes his way to the entrance, second denial, and over the course of first to third, there's about an hour's time that elapses. Denials were not in rapid succession, so Peter has an opportunity to think about what's going on. He has an opportunity to contemplate his next move, and he digs himself deeper and deeper into a hole. My dad used to say, when you're, when you're deep in a hole, stop digging. I suspect Peter was feeling more and more uncomfortable as the night went on. We already know he was tired since he couldn't stay when Jesus was praying in the garden. I can only imagine how tired he was by this. And I think that contributes to the increasing hostility in his responses, in his response to being identified as a follower of Jesus. Peter invokes a curse on himself and then began to swear. As I to the original Greek of verse 74, I see that Matthew uses two different phrases to amplify the words of Peter. In taking a curse and swearing, speaking of the same thing. Peter is promising that he's telling the truth, even calling on God to get involved. Peter is now totally committed to his course of action. He can't change the course of action now, even if he wanted to. He was so committed. It was then that Peter heard the rooster crow. Now Peter's heart must have sunk at that moment. The despair he must have felt. He knew what he had done. He knew the lies he had told. 
He knew the pain and frustration that Jesus must have also felt. Dr. Luke tells us that while Peter was uttering his third lie and the rooster crowed, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. So Jesus heard Peter deny him. The scene I see in my eyes is that Peter and Jesus locked eyes as Peter made the third denial, as the rooster crowed. He had just lied three times. And he even knew Jesus, his Lord and his friend. And now his Lord and friend knew it and knew that he knew. Peter's pain was even greater. Peter went out and wept bitterly. There's really not words for us to describe the anguish of Peter. I can't imagine the depth of Peter's despair. It had to be deep, 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 and painful. He had to have thought that he lost, or that the last contact he would have with his friend, that he'd spent three and a half years with. Remember, he was one of the inner circle. He was one of the three closest to to Jesus. Who had just been convicted of a capital crime that he didn't commit, he wasn't guilty of was sentenced to death where his friend goes to the cross was a lie, was a denial. After he said he was willing to die for him. Peter doesn't factor again into the story until Sunday morning. Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night had to be the most difficult hours of Peter's life. He was struggling because he had denied Jesus, just like Jesus said. He didn't need to. There weren't arrest warrants for them. Why did he do that? The question we'll get to ask him, I hope, someday. Matthew continues. He he ends the story of Peter there begins to now talk about Jesus being delivered to Pilate. Chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now sunrise. Rooster had crowed. It's now sunrise. The Sanhedrin gathers again. I think they gather again because they already convicted him. But I think they do it again in the morning to provide some sort of legitimacy to the verdict that that they had given the night before. I suspect that this meeting was in the Sanhedrin chambers in the temple complex. They again passed a verdict and again sentencing Jesus to death that really puzzled me. Why did Jesus get turned over to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate? We know that death sentences were given by the Sanhedrin. We just need to look at the book of Acts in the stoning of Stephen to know that they, they approved of and carried out death sentences. We also have many Jewish extra-biblical sources to indicate that capital punishment was within the Sanhedrin's purview. So if capital punishment was permissible by the Sanhedrin, why did they have to turn Jesus a pilot? We have to turn over to the Gospel of John for at least part of the answer. John chapter 8, verse 31. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. The stoning of Stephen reveals that it certainly had to be uh, lawful for them to put someone to death. I think the reason that they couldn't put Jesus to death was that they were in the middle of the Passover feast schedule. That would prohibit them from even trying Jesus and 
They kind of just ignored that part. But I think there's another reason. The Jews didn't have the ability to execute via a cross. That was a Roman punishment. The Jews could execute via stoning, but that wasn't so broadly public. A much more public and demonstrative form of execution was the Roman process of execution on the cross because it took some time. It, it was a process. The convicted person was led through the city carrying the cross. Not just Jesus. That was the normal course of events. So, I think the Jews wanted to make a statement with Jesus. The feast of Passover didn't really do what they had done. And so, they took him to Pilate, who wasn't trained in Passover, and could put him to death via the cross. So that everyone in town would see Jesus carrying the cross, and then see him outside of the gates hanging on the cross. The Sanhedrin wanted to make a spectacle out of Jesus. The spectacle needed to be in front of the entire city. They needed to make a big impact on anybody that was, had been a follower of Jesus. Look, your guy is dead. Your movement is dead. Back and be good little Jews and do what you're supposed to do. And stop this nonsense. That's the message from the Sanhedrin. In order to do that properly, it needed the Roman cross. So they turned Jesus over to the Romans. Pontius Pilate was the governor of the region. He was a Roman soldier placed in a region that Rome really wanted to keep the peace in. They had a deal with Israel. They would have Roman oversight, but they still do the things that they normally would do. They could have their high priest, but Rome got to pick them. Pontius Pilate was apparently pretty effective in his role because he'd already served as governor governors do. That would indicate that with his success. It also leads me to conclude that Pontius Pilate was willing to do things he wouldn't ordinarily do to keep the peace. Which is why I think he was willing to put Jesus to death. Matthew then switches topics a little by turning over to Judas. In the section that is labeled in most of our Bibles, Judas hangs himself. Matthew chapter 27 verses 3 through 5. And when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. We get the sense that Judas had been watching the activities like Peter had been the activities of the Sanhedrin, the activities of Annas, the activities of Caiaphas. And then he came back and saw the official sentencing by the Sanhedrin in the morning. Once he saw that, Jude, that Jesus was convicted and sentenced to die, his guilt got to be too much for him. He went back to the high priest in a, to reverse what he had done. The remorse of Judas doesn't mean that he came to a saving faith in Jesus. He was simply sorry that he had betrayed Jesus. The words used indicate that Judas was in deep emotional distress. was really, really, really agonizing over what he had done. I suspect that he had come to the conclusion that he was complicit in falsely accusing an innocent man. And because of his actions, Jesus was about to die. So Judas went back to the chief priest to recant the statement. Judas told them that he had betrayed an innocent man. Understand what, he, what Judas is saying. He is not guilty of blasphemy. He is God. He's not guilty of blasphemy. 
<clears throat> but the Sanhedrin wanted nothing to do with that. Their, re their response to Judas is very telling of their true heart the matter. They basically said, yeah, so what do we care? No, no, you don't understand, Judas says. He's not guilty. He is God. Yeah, 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 go shut up and go away. We don't care. Jesus had been convicted and turned over to the Romans to be publicly humiliated and executed. Their problem was solved. Remember, this was not about keeping the law. This was about keeping their power. And they were willing to do anything they could, including executing an innocent man in order to keep their power base. Their problem was solved. They could care if Jesus was guilty or not. They could care less if Judas was feeling guilty about turning over an innocent man. It reveals to me that the Sanhedrin didn't really care about the truth. They just wanted Jesus' problem solved. I should point out that the Sanhedrin clearly thought that they were in control of their own fate. God was completely in control. And everything that was happening was according to God's plan. The Sanhedrin thought they had solved everything. What they had done is exactly what God wanted done. No longer keep the 30 pieces of silver. He was too guilty. That was blood money. He, he couldn't keep it. He wouldn't take it back. Here, take the money. No, no. No, we can't do that. And he would not take the money back. I think there's a couple reasons for that. First, taking it back would imply some agreement that Jesus was innocent. Second, the money was now defined. It had been given for illegal and immoral use. There was no way to make that money pure again. Since they would not take the money back, Judas just threw it at them. Judas wanted to get as far away from what he had done as he could. Judas left the temple, and Matthew tells us Judas went out and hanged himself. Dr. Luke tells us something a little different in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now the man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all the bowels gushed out. Peter's talking to the other apostles there, and he's talking about Judas. Peter seems to indicate that Judas fell and disemboweled. Peter also talks about a field that Judas has acquired. So we have a conflict in the manner of death of Judas, or do we? There are a couple of logical explanations for the way for ways to reconcile Matthew's account with Peter's account in Acts. The first way is to treat Matthew's description as generically speaking of suicide, not as a specific description of method. In other words, he went out and hanged himself, meaning he went out and committed suicide. I find that answer to be a little less convincing. The re second way to reconcile is to view both Matthew as accurate. They have to both be accurate. They're both parts of Scripture, so they both have to be accurate. Since about the 4th century, the primary explanation is that Jesus hanged himself over a cliff, and either the branch or the robe broke, and he ended up to the ground, being disemboweled. I don't find that much of a conflict between what Matthew said and what Peter said. They're both descriptive Thing from different perspectives. Now, I know there are some theologians that challenge that as not being very logical, but I find it to be perfectly logical. That Matthew describes that just what Peter or what uh, Judas did, he went out and hanged himself. Dr. Luke, being the medical doctor, if you want, being the Quincy ME, going in and examining what happened. Well, Judas hung himself. Fell off the rope, or the rope 
broke or the branch broke and he crashed down to the ground and being bloated, his guts burst open. I can see that happening. Verse 6 of uh, back in uh, Matthew 27. This priest, taking the pieces of silver, said it's not lawful to put them in its blood money. So they took counsel and put them the potter's field as a birthplace for strangers. For the field has been called the field of blood this day. The priests realized that they couldn't take the, the money back into the temple. It was blood money. It had been used to prosecute an innocent man. The Sanhedrin knew Jesus was innocent. Otherwise, the money would not have been defiled. So they talked about it and decided to pay for a field where John's, uh, where, uh, where John Doe's could be buried. The statement by Matthew seems to be in conflict with Peter's statement in Acts 1. Go back to Acts 1.18. Now this man acquired a field, this man being Judas, with the rewards of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and his bowels gushed out. Matthew tells us that the Sanhedrin purchased the field. But here Peter seems to say that Judas purchased the field. There are two ways to reconcile this. When I look at the Greek text, I see that the word translated in in Acts 1, which we assume means purchase, it also potentially could mean uh, we could view the acquiring meaning that Judas came face to face with the field. So he's hanging on a rope over the field, the rope breaks, or the limb breaks, and he comes crashing down face to face with the field. That gets a little strained, I think, but it's a possible explanation. I don't think a great explanation, but a possible one. The second way to reconcile these verses is that perhaps Judas had purchased the field for whatever reason, knowing he was going to get the wind from the Sanhedrin. But he had not yet paid for it. We know that Judas was focused on money. We know that money was a big deal to Judas. And so he was looking at possibly business investments since he was going to get a large sum of money from the Sanhedrin. And since what he had planned in following Jesus didn't work out. So he bought the field, signed on the dotted line, but hadn't yet paid for it because he hadn't been paid by the Sanhedrin. So when he threw the money back into the temple, the Sanhedrin paid off the field in Judas' name and made it a potter's field. That seems to fit both passages nicely, I think. verse 9. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, and they took 30 pieces of silver, the price of him who a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave it for a potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Matthew then links the Jews and the purchase of the field with a prophet, prophecy attributed to Jeremiah. But this statement actually introduces another complexity for us, another difficulty. What Matthew quotes is actually from the chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordy price of what I priced by them. So I took the silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Matthew links these words, the words in the general context of the book of Jeremiah together. He puts them all together. The general context or the general thought is from Jeremiah 19. There's no real conflict here. Jeremiah is viewed by Jewish scholars of the day to be representative of all the later prophets. Remember, 
the minor prophets were minor, smaller prophecies. And so usually major prophets were said to be the, the speaker or the overarching um, representative of the later prophets. So when Matthew says that, according to Jeremiah, it could be just a reference to the later, the, the prophets later in the uh, exile. So there's no real conflict. What do we do with this section of Gospel of Matthew? First, I think that remorse of Judas and the fact that he recognized that Jesus was in, innocent is a testimony both of Jesus' divinity and of his perfection. Judas was against Jesus at that time, and yet he came to recognize Jesus was innocent. He recognized Jesus was God. He recognized Jesus was perfect. He was not guilty of blasphemy. It bothered Judas so much that he had betrayed an innocent man, leading to the eventual death of that innocent man that he committed suicide. Go on. He recognized who Jesus actually was. I'm fascinated that it took the betrayal of Judas or betrayal by Judas for Judas to recognize who Jesus actually was. It took Judas betraying Jesus for Judas to actually come to the conclusion of what he should have understood after spending three and a half years with Jesus. That Jesus was perfect. That Jesus was divine. That he is the Son of God. Second, I think that Judas' suicide and the purchase of the potters indicate that Jesus' innocence because the Sanhedrin recognized the money given to Judas was now tainted. It was tainted because it was used to betray an innocent man. And I think the Sanhedrin knew they had convicted a man and sentenced him to death. Not because he was guilty, but because he was in their way. I think these two pericopes illustrate for us God's plan was moving forward despite what men were doing and despite the innocence of Jesus. We need to remember Matthew is presenting a narrative to Jewish Christians 30 years after the He's reflecting on who Jesus was and what happened in him in order to bring salvation by following God the Father a legal means to forgive us. Matthew is providing us with a framework of the Passion Week so that we understand the sacrifice of Jesus. If Jesus was guilty, it was no sacrifice. He has to bring point after point after point for us to recognize Jesus was innocent. He did not have sins. He was not guilty of blasphemy. He is God. And so the sacrifice is real. Matthew is providing us with a framework of the passion so we understand that. So that we understand what would become the foundation of the church, the resurrection of Jesus, the death on the cross and the resurrection. Sin paid for, eternal life given. We should recognize the deity of Jesus, the innocence of Jesus, and the sacrifice of Jesus. When we do, then we'll have a better appreciation for Jesus and what he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. My sin was nailed to the cross just as if I nailed myself. Thank you for that. you that because of Jesus' death on the cross, you have a legal way to forgive me. And because Jesus came to the grave, I have a guarantee of eternal life. What a blessing that is. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. Thank you for calling us to be your children. Thank you for working out a plan that as we witness it in the pages of, of the gospel, 
It seems like that plan was a little bit barbaric. But the sacrifice of Jesus is necessary for us to be saved. So thank you for that sacrifice. We love you and we want to serve you. Thank you for the blessings you give us in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.